Okay, the title of the sermon this morning is Jesus Christ in Hell. Jesus Christ in Hell. So I like to teach this doctrine every now and then, just so people understand what Jesus actually went through in order to save us from our sins. Now, the Gospel is in 1 Corinthians 15. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the Gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. So if you ever wanted to know where a nice summary of the Gospel is, it's in 1 Corinthians 15, the, the clear death, burial, and resurrection. Now, Easter is a great time to reflect on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And today, I want you to understand the extent of his sacrifice. When the Bible says how that Christ died for our sins, now what did that entail? Some people think the suffering and the death on the cross was sufficient, right? And they say when he was on the cross, he said it, was, it is finished. But was it all finished? Was everything that needed to be done in order for us to be saved done? Is that what he meant by it is finished? He had still not even resurrected yet at that point. I mean, surely the resurrection, like in 1 Corinthians 15, is required for us to be saved. And yet, when he died, what did he mean by it is finished? It was because the death took place. But then he died, he went down and descended into hell to pay for our sins. He resurrected again, and now he's you know, gone up to heaven, sprinkled his blood on the mercy seat. But a lot of people don't understand that this is what Jesus had to go through to save us, right? That Jesus Christ descended into hell. A lot of people reject this doctrine, and this is why I teach this every now and then, especially for the new people in our church, for them to understand that this is a, a scriptural doctrine, a scriptural position, and we're going to look at these scriptures today. So we look at the physical torture that Christ endured, you know, and we're moved by that. But think about it. Many martyrs throughout time have t been tortured. You know, many people throughout time have been tortured. You know, even Hebrews talks about it in Hebrews 11, right? Many were tortured, sawn asunder, all these sorts of things. They've gone through terrible things, even gave their life. But what you have to understand is what makes Christ's sacrifice for us different, that it could satisfy the wrath of God on our behalf. And many people, when they learn about this doctrine, that Jesus Christ suffered in hell for us as well, they're sometimes a bit shocked, right? But obviously he didn't go to hell for his own sins, right? He died for our sins, right? He died on the cross for our sins. He descended and paid for the wrath of God on our behalf in hell. So many people, sometimes they are shocked when they learn about this doctrine. But to me, it actually made a lot of sense. I mean, the punishment for me, for my sins is death, and what, what God means by death is my soul goes to hell. How is, my, how is Jesus a substitute for me if he never ever experiences that punishment? Right? So you see how he had to experience that punishment in order to pay the punishment that we so rightly deserve. So to me, it never made sense that a physical beating and a suffering and a death and resurrection, bodily death and resurrection, paid for my punishment, which was to go to hell. But if Jesus Christ satisfied that punishment by going to hell, then that made a lot of sense for me. So five things I want you to see today from the Bible, <coughs> how Jesus Christ went to hell and suffered in hell on our behalf. So thank God for that. So the first one is, the first point is just, it's clearly taught in the Bible, I don't know if you know this, if you haven't read through Acts before, but when Peter is preaching on David's Psalms, right, and we know and we recognize, and we, I know we talk about Peter's preaching in the book of Acts by Luke, and, but we recognize that this is all God's word, right, but God has used men to pen down his inspired word, and, you know, and uh, that's, a, that's an interesting thing in and of itself. But this is why we started at Psalm 16. Psalm 16, we read in verse 8, I've set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoices. My flesh also shall rest in hope, for thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, 
neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. So you see here that David writing the Psalms, often he is quoting, he's referring prophetically to things that happened to Jesus Christ. Because did David go to hell? No, David didn't go to hell. And we'll see later when uh, Peter preaches on this very passage in Acts chapter 2. But this is not the only time that David mentions his sort of encounter with hell, even though he never went to hell. Look at Psalm 18. The sorrows of death compassed me, and the floods of ungodly men made me afraid. The sorrows of hell compassed me about. The snares of death prevented me. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple, and my cry came before him even into his ears. So you know, when you know this is referring to Jesus Christ, then it gives you a bit of insight into what is actually happening in those three days and three nights where Jesus Christ is buried, his body, but his soul is actually descended into hell. And we get some insight here from the Psalms. Psalm 86, I will praise thee, O Lord my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify thy name forevermore. For great is thy mercy toward me, and thou hast, look at this, delivered my soul from the lowest hell. So you see, David did not go down. So what is he talking about? Well, in Acts 2, we don't have to wonder what is being talked about because in Acts 2, Peter actually preaches on Psalm 16. And look at what he says. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. So he says, you guys know about Jesus. He did all these miracles among you. Him being delivered by the determinate council... And foreknowledge of God, right? Because God had already planned out, right? The, the plan of salvation, how Jesus was going to die and raise again. He already knew all these things that were going to happen. Ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Right? So where was he not being able to hold? We'll, we'll talk about that later. Verse 25. For David speaketh concerning him. Right? So this is Psalm 16. I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. So you see how Peter is saying, David said in the psalm, he spoke concerning Jesus Christ. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. So he reads off the rest of Psalm 16. Now he explains the psalm. 29. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulchre is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He seeing this, so you see how David saw the resurrection prophetically. He seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell. So whose soul was not left in hell? David's? No, Jesus Christ's soul was not left in hell. Neither his, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Now we could just end it there and just, just prove and just say, look, Jesus Christ went to hell for our sins. How can we deny this? This is Peter plainly explaining as he is preaching on Psalm 16. David was not talking about himself about his soul not being left in hell. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. So that's my first point. The first point is, it's just plainly preached by Peter on the day of Pentecost, explaining the resurrection and how Jesus Christ's soul was not left in hell. But that's not where it ends. I'll show you, some, I'll show you four other points that make it very clear that Jesus went to hell for our sins and suffered there and overcame that 
and rose from the dead. The true dead, right? The soul that sinneth, it shall die. You know, when our, so, you know, all of us experience the physical death, right? But when Jesus says, you know, whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die, he's talking because we will never ever, our soul will never ever descend into death, like right? the real death, hell, right? And this is why the lake of fire is the second death, because you die once, your soul descends into hell, you're resurrected, and then you're thrown into the lake of fire. That's why it's the second death, right? It's not your first death is the physical death, right? That's just your soul separating from your body. Your body dies, yes, but the first death, I believe, is you go into hell, the second death. That's why those of us who live and believe in Jesus Christ shall never die. But we all experience physical death. That's why it's not talking about physical death. So that's number one, Peter's preaching. The second one we talked about when we went through the book of Jonah is the sign of Jonah. But we'll look at it again, Matthew 12. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. So these are the scribes and Pharisees asking for you know, more miracles than Jesus had already done, right? But maybe some of these had not seen some of the miracles. They're just hearing about them. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. So this is Jonah. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now some people think Jesus' body was buried, and that's three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. I mean, would you consider six feet under the heart of the earth? You know, the heart of something is like the very center. What's in the center of the earth right now? That's hell. Right? It's not too hard to believe that hell is in the center of the earth when you know, volcanoes erupt and like molten hot lava come <laughs> spewing out. You know, scientists are trying to say, oh, it's just like a solid lead core and all that. But nobody knows what's in hell. They can bounce their waves down there and think, it's, you know, think whatever they want. But we know from the Bible, we know what's down there. You know, and that's hell. But notice how Jonah was a sign to them. Three days and three nights he was in the whale's belly. So shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now what's interesting about this, now we go to Jonah in the Old Testament, in Jonah 2. And look at what Jonah says. Then Jonah prayed unto the Lord, his God, out of the fish's belly. So this is like David, where Jonah now is preaching on behalf right, of Jesus Christ. He's in the fish's belly, but look at what he says. And I said, I cried by reason of mine affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. For thou hast cast me into the deep, in the midst of the seas, and the floods compassed me about. All thy billows and thy waves passed over me. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight, yet I will look again toward thy holy temple. The waters compassed me about even to the soul so I want you to just notice how much soul is being brought up here, right? Even at the beginning, his soul was not left in hell, right? So what died? The body died, the soul left the body, right? So now we're talking about the soul. The body was buried. Jesus Christ's soul descended into hell. The depth closed me round about. The weeds were wrapped about my head. I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars, look at this, was about me forever. Yet hast thou brought up my life from corruption, O Lord my God. So you see, because Jesus is eternal, he was able to satisfy an eternality of God's wrath in three days and three nights. But why did he do it in three days and three nights? I mean, he could have done it in a second. He could have done it in a hundred years. Why three days and three nights? Well, it's because it's to fulfill scripture, right? As Jonah was three days and three nights in the heart of the... Um, in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, some people believe, like, uh, you know, I'll just touch on this briefly, but some people believe that Jesus went to hell but didn't suffer, right? And I, I completely disagree with that. I think part of it, he had to experience the suffering that we would have had to experience if we had gone to hell, right? Because he died for our sins. And if we read and compare this to Psalm 88, we did this when we looked at Jonah, we can see here the suffering and the wrath that he is taking on, he's actually taking on. Why does he have to go to hell in our place? To satisfy the wrath of God. Right? So he had to die the wages of sin. He's dead. He had to suffer to fulfill scripture according to the scriptures. He had to shed his blood to redeem us. Right? The blood has a redemptive act. 
and also the sprinkling of the mercy seat, but the but the payment, the the no, sorry, not the payment, but the the punishment of hell is satisfying God's wrath in our place. Psalm 88, verse 6, Thou hast laid me in the lowest pit, in darkness, in the deeps. Thy wrath lieth hard upon me, and thou hast afflicted me with all thy waves. Selah. Verse 15, I am afflicted and ready to die from my youth up, while I suffer thy terrors. I am distracted. Thy fierce wrath goeth over me. Thy terrors have cut me off. So you see here that what Jesus went through for us as he suffered in hell those three days and three nights, but he rose again, thank God, and uh, overcome death. So that's the second point. So first point, Peter's preaching. Second is the sign of Jonah. Isn't it interesting that Jonah was a sign? And you go to Jonah, and Jonah says, out of the belly of hell, cried I. Number three, Jesus Christ, our Passover. Jesus Christ, our Passover. And I'll explain to you how Jesus Christ is our Passover. Because you remember in uh, Exodus, they did, they did the Passover lamb, and Jesus is a picture of that Passover lamb. 1 Corinthians 5, your glorying is not good. What's this glorying? Glorying that we are, or that the church is accepting of certain sins, right? Welcoming of certain sins. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. All right, so now we know what the bread represents, right? Sin is often represented by leaven. Right, nothing wrong with leaven in and of itself, because that's what leaven is used as a picture of. It spreads, right? So just like you had the unleavened bread, it says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. So notice how the Passover was eaten with unleavened bread and with the lamb, and the spiritual significance of that in the New Testament is God wants the church to be an unleavened bread, right? Get the sin out of the church. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. So there's that picture. Christ is the Passover lamb, and we are the unleavened bread, right? This is what we should be. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So a lot of people believe that communion, you know, as we break bread and take of the cup together, is a continuation of the Passover. And this is not true. Right? These are totally different things. It's like, it's like the Protestants and the Catholics want you to believe that baptism is a continuation of circumcision so they can baptize their babies, right? That's one way they justify it. Right? But, you know, why don't they only baptize only the boys then, you know, and not the girls? There's all these questions that you can ask, right? But a lot of people think as well that communion is a continuation of the Passover, but it's not, right? These are completely two different practices, right? One is, you know, G -G remembering Jesus, right? The other was remembering them coming out of Egypt, right? Yes, they have significance in regards to salvation, but they're two different things. So wherein it says here in 1 Corinthians 5 verse 8, therefore let us keep the feast, look, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness. So we're not keeping the actual physical feast where we're expected to eat unleavened bread and do that. We're not even continuing it <coughs> by remembering with the bread and the cup. It says we're keeping the feast not with the old leaven, right? So not with actual bread, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness. How do we keep this feast? But with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Right, so how does God want us to keep the Passover? By remembering, right, about the Lord Jesus Christ and, you know, being sincere and being people of truth. Right, that's what it's about. It's about, you know, purging out the leaven, the sin from our lives, so that church will be an unleavened lump. Now, what's the point I'm making here in regards to Jesus Christ suffering for our sins? In hell. Notice how Christ is our Passover. So that means the Passover is a picture of what Jesus Christ did. Now, let's go back to Exodus 12. And I want to show you here the very specific instructions given to the nation of Israel of how they were to carry out this Passover lamb. And it's very interesting. It all ties in together. 
Exodus 12, And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. So if you remember in Exodus 12, this was the last plague, right, going through Egypt. And maybe you remember the Charles Heston, you know, Ten Commandments, you know, they're all preparing the meal and he puts the blood on the doorpost, I think if I remember that movie correctly. So this is the last plague going in. What was the last plague? The angel of death would visit. Every firstborn would be killed, except those that had the blood on the doorpost, right? So that blood represents the blood of Jesus Christ. And if the angel saw the blood on the doorpost, he said, I will pass over you. Right? So that's where the word Passover comes from, right? Where the blood was on the doorpost. God passed over. This is a word that was actually made up by Tyndale, I think, because um, <clears throat> I think the word Passover means something else. But um, anyways, this month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, They shall take to them every man a lamb according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto him, his house, take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your count for the lamb. So people are getting together, eating lamb, you know, and uh, killing this lamb in representation of the sacrifice for the blood. Your lamb shall be without blemish. A male of the first year, ye shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats, and ye shall keep it up until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. So it's interesting now, that sort of lines up, if you don't know the prophecy, this, is, this sort of lines up with Jesus going into Jerusalem, with, you know, Palm Sunday they talk about, laying, this is when he's presented, right? And then three days... Uh, four days, you know, four days later on the fourth day, this is like the Wednesday when he's killed, uh, Wednesday night, and then three days and three nights, and then he rises again on Sunday. <clears throat> the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening, and they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses, wherein they shall eat it. Now look at this. And they shall eat the flesh in the night, in that night, pay attention now, roast with fire and unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw, nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire, his head with his legs and with the pertinence thereof, and ye shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning ye shall burn with fire. So isn't that interesting that God makes it a point that, hey, when you prepare this Passover lamb, don't eat it raw, don't boil it, make sure it is roasted with fire. Why? Because it was a picture of what Jesus Christ was going to do for us, right? How he suffered in hell uh, for us. So isn't that interesting that Christ is our Passover and then specific instructions about the Passover were to make sure it was roasted with fire. Two more. Number four is a sweet savour. A sweet savour. Now look at what it says here in Ephesians 5, verse 1. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God <coughs> for a sweet-smelling savour. Now this phrase here, sweet-smelling savour, if you know, if you've read through your Bible, you'll know that this is a very repeated phrase throughout the book of Leviticus and Exodus and whatnot. A sweet savour. That's how it talks about it in the Old Testament. Now, what is the significance of Christ being an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savour? Well, look at what it says here in Exodus 29, 18. And thou shalt burn the whole ram upon the altar. It is a burnt offering unto the Lord. It is a sweet savour, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. 
So notice that the phrase, a sweet smelling savour, the sweet savour is the picture of a sacrifice of an animal being burnt and then that sweet smelling savour being risen up. And, you know, sometimes you think, oh, you know, it's get really stinky and whatnot and there, I, I can imagine it smelled really good, you know, like when you cook meat and whatnot, that sweet smelling savour, you know, when you, when you, the fresh meat that goes onto the grill, you can, you can so it's almost sweet sometimes when you, uh, you know, you put a steak on the, on the grill and that first sear is like that kind of sweet smelling savour, what do they call it, umami, the umami flavour. <laughs> so notice here how the burnt offering and a sweet savour. And Jesus Christ gave himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet savour. What do you think those fires represent in that burnt offering? Well, that's the fires of hell. Isaiah 53. I want to show you a couple of things here. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. So Isaiah 53 also talks about his physical suffering. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs. Born is carry, right? So it's the same here. And carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was buried for our iniquities, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter. Well, that's a Passover lamb, right? And as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Now this is the verse I want you to pay attention to, verse 10. Look at this. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul. So this is why I think he suffered in hell. Here's another verse to show. There was travail happening in his soul. And shall be satisfied by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So notice here in verse 10, when it says here, he hath put him to grief, when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. And remember, when Jesus died on the cross, that was his body being bruised, beaten, and buried. When was his body made an offering for sin? His body was never burnt like a burnt offering and a sweet-smelling savour. So this is why, because his soul, after he died and was buried, where was his soul? It descended into hell, and it was the sweet-smelling savour. Three days later, he rose again. This was the extent of dying for our sins. He experienced, like I said, true death of the soul, not just of the suffering of the body. Right? And the last one, the last one is the gates of hell. The gates of hell. <laughs> so here's some interesting passages here. <coughs> Acts 2. If you remember in Acts 2, this phrase was said in verse 24, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Right? So now we know that the death that he experienced was actually the death of the soul in hell but we know that death could not take hold of Jesus Christ. He overcame death because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Now, I just think this is interesting because I want to compare this passage to Matthew 16. 
And this is often a passage that is used by the Catholic Church to try and prove that Simon Peter was the first pope and that the church is built on Simon Peter. But I want to show you as we read through this, you know, it would not make sense at all for God to build his church on a man. So what is this rock being talked about when God is building his church on it? Look at what it says here in verse 16. Simon Peter answered and said, so this is in response to Jesus saying, whom think you that I am? Whom do men say that I am? Right? <clears throat> and then he says, you know, some say Elias, say say John the Baptist, and whom say ye that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon bar Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee. So what is this it? Right? This it is the fact that Jesus Christ, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Because remember, when he rose again from the dead, that's what was being declared. That was what was being made known publicly, that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. Right? Until now, it's just him sort of preaching and doing miracles and it's not really being declared. Right? What was declared later is when they all went out to preach, declaring that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, like we saw in Acts 2. Flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. So what's the focus of this passage? The fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Is, is the focus Simon Peter? No. Simon Peter is just who it got revealed to. Verse 18, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock. So what's the rock that the church is going to get built on? What just got revealed to Peter? That Jesus Christ, is, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And, I will, and upon this rock, I will build my church. Look at this. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Right? What's the it? Jesus Christ is the Christ. So what's interesting that here, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. I want to come back to that in a moment because I just find it interesting that it talks about the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, and then it starts to talk about these keys of the kingdom of heaven, and or these, it mentions keys, right? I'll show you something a bit later. Now, often the way this is preached in churches is people will say, oh, you know, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church, right? Because they think the it is referring to the church, and they think like gates are defensive, mechanism, the gates of hell, you know, we're storming the gates of hell, where the church is going to storm the gates of hell and fight, you know, fight this kingdom that's somehow in hell and whatnot. Now that's if you believe that, one, <laughs> that hell is some kingdom where Satan is reigning and, you know, there's a kingdom down there, as opposed to where God reigns in hell. God is reigning in hell, right? So there's no point God storming his own kingdom, right? So hell is not some kingdom of Satan and the church is not storming this kingdom because hell is a place of punishment where things go in and don't get out, right? So not only that, is why would we be going into a place of punishment, right? Where people are already be punishing, punished in hell. So these gates are often preached as defensive mechanisms, but they're not. The gates are there, you've got to think like a prison. They're keeping people in hell. That's the problem. That's the gates of hell. The gates of hell are people going to hell and they can't get out, right? Because hell is like a prison, right? It's eternal. It's an eternal prison. So what is the gates of hell shall not prevail against it? That means something is coming out of hell and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Well, if you think about what we're talking about and even in this passage, right? Jesus, the Son of God, He's the Christ, the Son of the living God. How will the gates of hell not prevail against it? Jesus Christ, the Son of God. For whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Right? So that's what I think is the right interpretation of Matthew 16. When it says, The gates of hell shall not prevail against the rock, the rock is the Lord Jesus Christ and hell cannot keep him there. He overcame death and hell. 
Look in Revelation 1. I just want to show you the sort of parallel here to Jesus talking about himself as a, and, and also we see the mention of these keys. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, <coughs> this is the vision in uh, Revelation 1 that John gets, <coughs> one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. So this is why when you see, you know, pictures of, you know, Jesus Christ, you know, he's got the white hair, right, and the robe and whatnot, because this is the picture we're given in Revelation. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, right? This is like the word of God, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Oh, I think I actually accidentally cut off that. Cut off that in my notes, but uh, no, I'll just I'll just tell tell you about. It. Basically, what he says in Revelation, he says, "I was dead." He says, "I'm the first and the last. I was dead, and I have the keys of death and in hell. Behold, I'm alive forevermore." I'm sorry, I think I cut this out of my uh, my notes here, but I just wanted to show you the parallel with Revelation. You can go look at it yourself later, so I won't take the time to put it in my notes. But look at it later in Revelation one where Jesus talks about he, he, I am and was dead and behold, I am alive forevermore. Right, Talking about his death and hell. And then he says, I have the keys of death and of hell uh, in Revelation. So I wanted to draw that parallel um, in Matthew 16, but obviously I, I stuffed that up a bit with my notes. The last thing I want to show you here, when it comes down to Jesus dying, descending into hell, and rising again is in Ephesians 4, verse 7. Ephesians 4. Look what it says here. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. So this is talking about Jesus Christ rising from the dead and ascending into heaven. Look at what it says here in verse 9. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. So isn't it interesting here in Ephesians 4, that it says here, before Jesus Christ ascended into heaven, first he descended into the lower parts of the earth. Now did his body descend into the lower parts of the earth? No, his body was buried in the tomb, right, into the sepulchre. And we don't even know, was that a tomb even down, you know? It could have been even above sea level. But look at what he says here. Now that he ascended, so we know that he ascended, you know, the, the day of Pentecost when they, he went up. What is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. All right, so five things for you to consider if you're wondering, you know, did Jesus Christ go to hell for us? I think the, the scriptural case is quite strong. Peter preached it plainly, first of all. His soul was not left in hell. The sign of Job, Jonah, remember, out of the belly of hell cried out, and thou heardest my voice. Our Passover, make sure the Passover is burnt. Not eaten raw, not boiled. Anything left next day, burn it all, right? A sweet savour, that's the burnt sacrifice, a sweet-smelling savour, and then the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What is it? Is that trying to keep things out of hell? No, that's making sure the gates keep things in hell, but the gates could not prevail against Jesus Christ rising from the dead. So I think this doctrine is well supported in Scripture. And it also helps us to understand how we are saved from hell. Because right? how can a death pay for an eternity of hell? Whereas if Jesus Christ suffered in hell, an eternal being going there can pay for hell for us. And you know, it shows as well that Christ is eternal and infinite. Because otherwise, how could he have paid for an eternal suffering of hell in a finite period of time? Because he himself is eternal. And I hope, you know, that this sermon 
as I drill this point home, it gives you a greater appreciation of Christ's love for you, you know, so that you might live for him. So I want you to just reflect on this last verse. 1 John 3.16. So, John, you know, the 3.16s in the Bible are quite interesting. You know, Genesis 3.16 is talking about bruising the head of a serpent. John 3.16, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And this is 1 John 3.16. Hereby perceive we the love of God. See, this is how we understand the love of God. Because he laid down his life for us. And now you know the extent of what that means. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So as you have a greater understanding of Christ's love for you, hopefully that helps you to have a greater love for others. All right, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for this great sacrifice, Lord, that you did for us. Uh, Lord, we can't even imagine uh, the terrors that you went through for us. And thank you, Lord, that you did it and were made a curse on our behalf. Thank you, Lord, that you overcame, you rose again from the dead, and because of you, we can celebrate days like today. We thank you, Lord, for eternal life. We thank you that only through you, through faith in your blood, we have assurance of salvation. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.